Hello guys and welcome back to Dev++. Today's episode is going to be about JavaScript, async away versus then catch. Talking about asynchronous code on JavaScript. Um, so what we're going to see today is going to talk a little bit about uh, JavaScript and four core concepts about how Node.js and JavaScript runtime works, right? Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about the event loop, uh, the stack on JavaScript, the queue on JavaScript and non-blocking I.O. This just to understand a little bit about how our synchronous uh, operations work in JavaScript, right? Then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the callbacks versus promises, how the old way of managing uh, non-blocking I.O. on JavaScript was uh, versus, you know, using now uh, promises. And then we're going to see a little bit of, uh, you know, a couple of examples regarding using a sync await uh, versus then and catch, right? Um, what you need to to go and follow through this video, uh, basically some basic knowledge about JavaScript, uh, an ID or text editor, um, sorry for JavaScript if you want to, and just, just uh, 15 minutes of your time. Let me just fix this slide here. Just say for JavaScript, and I use WebStorm. Cool, perfect. So going back to your presentation, right? So first of all, JavaScript and uh, their asynchronous model, right? So if, if you're familiar with a little bit with how JavaScript works, uh, you know that it's a, a single threaded uh, environment where only one thing is done at a time, right? Uh, that doesn't mean it cannot do multiple things at the same time for multiple programs. It's just that their model, how they uh, created the runtime environment is just to perform one single task very fast, uh, you know, at a single moment, right? With that in mind, you will ask yourself, then how does a browser or, you know, a script or my Node.js server can run like multiple things or hundreds of, of requests at the same time? So that's what we're going to explain here, right? Um, so before we jump into, uh, you know, how, how, to, how it does handle like multiple things, uh, let's talk a little bit about two other parts of that environment, which is the stack and the queue. And then we jump into talking about non-blocking IO and how does uh, JavaScript manages to do a lot of things at the same time, right? So basically how that event, event uh, loop works is that it's constantly looking for things to do, right? Uh, JavaScript has the concept of a queue, which is basically the list of things that that event loop needs to uh, be pending or be checking in order to do something, right? And within that queue, you um, have stacks, or different stacks, right? What a stack is, is basically how the environment tracks, whenever you call a function, you call another function, and you call another function, that trace about what's the order of things and how they're gonna be executed, that's what is called the stack, right? So whenever you uh, tell the browser uh, to do something, it basically creates a new stack of things to do, and he puts that in an an element on the queue. Then the event loop is just waiting for things to uh, execute and to be done, right? So again, back to the question, how does the browser, and just let's follow through the example of the browser, right, of, of a web environment. How does the browser manage to do a lot of things at the same time, like listen, listen to uh, user inputs and events, right? Mouse events, uh, making requests for pulling like images, more scripts, data, rendering actually the UI and then making changes through the UI, well, that's where the non-blocking IEO operations comes into play or concept comes into place, right? There are a lot of operations in JavaScript that, that they are delegated to underlying functions, right? Like to the browser itself, to the operating system. Uh, you can think about this like uh, thinking on a web request or an HTTP request, right? When, when your uh, application, your web application is doing a request to an external server, you don't necessarily use all the resources of JavaScript or your environment to do that. So basically what the what the environment does is start using underlying functions of the browser or the operating system to make those requests, right? Connect it to uh, the server, start pulling like data, parsing HTTP tags, uh, making the encryption, you know, and all those sort of things, right? In the meantime, the browser and the operating system are doing those tasks, those tasks, the event loops just put you back on a queue 
and then start looking for things to do again, right? So again, the concept here is that every time that the event loop starts doing something can, they can, that is considered like a non blocking input output task, it just puts you back on the, on the queue and it starts doing something else. That's how JavaScript managed to do a lot of things at the same time, right? You just listen for an event, you hit the keyboard, move, move, move the mouse, he, he does whatever he needs to do, and then he gives it back to, you know, looking for things to do. You create a request, he puts a request in the browser, the browser is doing the request, he's for, searching for more things to do, like rendering, listen to the mouse, listen to events, doing a bunch of things. And whatever, whenever, uh, you know, that thing that he put on hold is ready, that thing just gets put back on the key you and then he, he just run through that process of hey is this ready to be done is this ready to be completed is this ready to be completed and that's how you manage to do that uh, asynchronous operations right so one thing that we're going to see in these examples is uh, a very important uh function that is called set timeout right uh it's a it's a core uh function of, of javascript right you can find it on the browser you can find it on on yes and basically, uh, this function, what it does is whatever you pass them as a function, um, he can execute this in a future time. So you can even set up like to uh, execute like in, in, in a determined amount of seconds, like one seconds, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, or whatever time you, you want, right? Uh, the system and the environment is very good tracking those times to be able to put that code that you set there back on a queue to be executed, right? The very important thing about the set timeout, and it's really important for these examples that we're going to do today, is that even if you put zero seconds to wait on the on the set set timeout uh, call, uh, whenever you call the set timeout, you get automatically pushed to the end of the queue, right? So that's going to be used to simulate like things like requests and and things like that. So you can see an example of non-blocking I.O. Uh, actually you know, being real on, on, the, on the queue, right? Uh, after that, we're going to ju just show you, uh, you know, different examples regarding callbacks and promises. And at the end, I'm going to show you the difference between a sync and a wait and then catch. There are basically ways to, you know, manage a synchronous code and asynchronous functions on JavaScript, right? So, all right, so let's jump to callback and promises, right? Um, I'm just going to create a small project here. I'm going to call this JavaScript sync wait versus then catch. All right, I'm going to open my IDE. I'm just going to open that specific folder. Perfect. I'm just going to cd into it it's just going to create a couple files um sync we call sync but yes and i'm going to create an index .js. just pretty super simple right here i'm gonna do the examples that we're going to use with this file right so um back in the days in the early days of javascript um the preferred way of executing this asynchronous code was through callbacks, right? So let's say for a second, we're gonna create a function here. I'm gonna call this main, right? No sync yet, right? And, and whenever I run the script, I'm just gonna run main, right? So I'm gonna, hello world here, right? So whenever you executed a, a function from, um, from JavaScript that, that it does like some sort of like an asynchronous uh, task. Um, usually the common way of handling this were, was to set in a callback, right? Callback for success and a callback for error. Meaning that, that um, you know, whenever that's done and completed with success and error, that function was going to be called, right? Something pretty similar to, let's just give you an example, like, uh, making HTTP request, right? So it will take like a set of ob objects and parameters, and then it will take like either a single callback function that it will result into the 
error or success or two functions, one for the error and one for the success, right? Just to make this example simple, let's call it like one single function, right? Let's say that it will return like response and an error just to give you uh, an example. And whenever you make this um, call, right, you send this um, function in, you know, whenever JavaScript was done with the processing, he was just, uh, you know, calling this function for you to do your stuff, right? Um, so let's see, let's, let's create this example, right? So I'm just going to export a function called making a HTTP request. So remember that I told you that we were going to use a lot of this set timeout just to simulate, you know, getting bump outside, uh, you know, at the end of the queue. Uh, let's call this payload, right? Whatever you could send and a callback function, right? So how the set timeout works, it's just going to refer to the official documentation here for uh, MDM, right? Is that you send a function reference, right? Could be an anonymous function, something defined there in line two. And then um, you send a delay parameter, which is the time milliseconds the system will have to wait into uh, just to execute in your code, right? Then a set of parameters, if you want to pass the parameters there, that is also, uh, you know, depending on how you want to use it, right? You can use just like anonymous function, but we're gonna use in this case, and then, you know, just work our way through it, right? So let's say, set timeout, right? Define an inline function, right, with the arrow. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna execute this two seconds later. So what I'm gonna simulate here is that at the end of this, I'm just gonna call my callback. Uh, we said that a response, an error, let's see, this is null. Right, just no error at this time. It's not the purpose of this um, uh, exercise, right? So this is pretty much how internally, um, or sometimes in our mocking, how internally were uh, those asynchronous function functions will work, right? You just create a request, you send a callback, and sometimes in the future this was uh, this was called, right? Um, all right, let me, yep, let's import this, right? So we're gonna call this, we're gonna attach this hello world. I'm just gonna add this, uh, um, the payload that we have here. Let's use a stringify here for the payload, right? Just to add whatever we're sending, like echo or whatever. Let's go on one, right? So whenever we get the response, right, we're just gonna do something like this. If we have an error, we just say, hey, hey, error. And if we have a success, success, all right. So let's try to run this to see what happens. I'm just gonna use the terminal here, check my node version, 14. I think I have to use 16, but let's just roll with it. Yeah, I have to create a package. Oh, 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 we need to call it down, version one, description, and index, test command. Yada yada yada. Yes. So I'm gonna use MBM for you. Use my 16 version of Node. Right. I have to type this as a module line. Just for him to understand import statement. Or Mm -mm. All right, so this better better use this common yes and instead of just gonna do clones require 
that the wrong conversation. Okay, so I'm just going to test this. Uh, yeah, I need to change this. Just to make an export. Right? So if we run the script, right, basically that's what happened. Happening, right? I'm waiting two seconds to execute the callback that I'm sending, right? This was pretty much how everything used to work for JavaScript. The problem with this was that, let's say, for example, that you want to make another request that depends on the first uh, information that you receive, right? So if that was the case, you probably will have to, you know, manage the error somehow. Let's, let's, propagate the error right. and then you know um here we'll have to do like the other requests making http requests so the payload is going to be our response right and then we stuck again with another call right um some people refer to this as callback hell right um just because if you're doing this like multiple times such as parsing a json such as uh you know reading a file or updating the interface this could get like really really crazy right um actually uh, um you know the autocomplete for the autopilot is just going just went nuts uh, there, right there right so let's uh we, you will have to do like same thing here right if an error we just throw the error right uh, and then just console log you know response response right and if we write if we run this again we're gonna see that uh, uh you know it's just gonna take a, a few seconds and a couple of seconds it's just gonna return uh the value uh you know once again right so this is pretty much, um, you know, how things uh, used to work with the callbacks, right? Again, this could get like really ugly, really fast, and it's not very readable, right? If you start like tracking parentheses and, you know, uh, uh, all the structures, it gets like really, really complicated, right? So in order to uh, help with this, uh, you know, the promises were created, right? So basically the promises, uh, like the duration over the callbacks is, uh, I'll return an object, right? That once you start executing, he's gonna asynchronously, asynchronously return an object or the response, right? Or, or he's gonna throw an error, basically, right? So let's do our promise version of making an HTTP request, right? So let's call this making an HTTP request callback. Right, we're back to which the name that's it. So, this is going to be making an HTTP request promise. Do refer back to right So, the way that this will work, I'm going to call this main callback to this proper naming. Like, naming is super important, right? And, and let's not run this for now, and let's call this main. Promise. Right, so the main promise was a little bit similar. Um, you know, we could also simulate a promise here with the promise API, right? So I'm just going to do is a return a new promise here, right? New promise object. Right? And the thing about the promise is that. Um, you know, in order to return the value, you have to run this resolve function, right? So we're gonna use this resolve function. Uh, you use reject for throwing an error. Um, let's put like a code here. So let's say that if the payload dot a equals zero, so we're just gonna reject this with an error, right? Put this first. We put the proper return. 
else we just resolve this. Just to be clear here, that we, know, we don't need to return anything and just reject it, right? So this is the promise version. Remember that I'm returning a promise. The cool thing about the promise is that it is an object that holds that future execution. So you don't have to actually put the code in this way way you have the tools to do it in a better way so let's let's just do it in a better way right let's say that i'm doing the request number one right request one i'm making this promise right make an http promise so make sure to do the import right <clears throat> So what I'm doing here is that now I have a promise, right? So the promise doesn't start to get resolved, right? Until I use the dot then or uh, yeah, the dot then uh, function on the promise. So similar to a callback, right? This was, this was uh, allowing us to pass a function in order to resolve to this, right? With the big difference that Promises understand promises, right? So I could do this, right? Returning my second request, right? Or just to make it a little bit more clear, it's gonna do this. This is my second request, and I'm just gonna send it again. The, the, and I'm just gonna return the request too. So what this allows me to do is change these calls just like I used to do with callbacks, right? But you see this is a little bit cleaner, right? Uh, I just need to uh, manage here the errors, right? And I'm just gonna do just that, right? First of all, as I'm returning a, a, a promise here, I could change my chain my promises with another then, right? Just gonna do this. And then here is where I'm gonna translate this and log my final response, right? And for managing the error, right, a pretty consistent way of managing errors is that whatever, whichever promises throws an error, I could put it here and just always fall into this catch function, right? So if you look, the syntax is a little bit better. It looks a little bit better. Let's make a run, right? Uh, we go here to the terminal again. Let's just, now that we have a lot of code, let's move here, right? So we switch this to use 16. So we go on node and then start the AS, right? So it's gonna do pretty much the same thing. It's gonna wait four seconds and it's gonna print hello world with the result of the previous promise, right? So there is there is a little bit of enhancement here regarding this, right? We could even simply do something like this. Just return on this it's going to change it it looks a little bit better the error management is, is a little bit uh neat but the most important thing is that now that promise or that object that eventually is going to return a value it has a shape it has a it has something that we can manipulate right and this is going to become really important when we're going to see the difference between a sync and a wait right because uh one of the cool thing about promises is that javascript offers uh um, the promise.all function, which is definitely a game changer regarding you know, versus the callbacks, right? The promise.all, it allows you to put multiple promises in, in a single uh, list, right? And resolve them all at the same time, right? Meaning that if you're doing multiple requests or fetching multiple things, that of course they don't depend on each other, you can use promises.all to make them faster uh, using all the resources on the system, right? Um, here, you could also return the promise and change this with the dot then, but there, there's also another way of doing this, right? Uh, just to not overcomplicate this. Uh, we could do, similar to a callback, instead of making this dot then here, I'm just, just gonna move it here and put it here. Right, that's also a valid way of doing this. It's just, you know, this is a valid chaining just because you don't want 
and your code just start uh, looking like a lot of callbacks uh, of, of what you're doing right, right there, right? Okay, so I hope, hope that's clear, right? So then we go to our final, uh, uh, you know, uh, item of our conversation, which is a single way versus then catch. As you just witnesses, um, the then catch syntax is pretty much this, the way of resolving a promise and catching errors through a promise. There's, there is another way of doing this, right? There's a third way. Let's do another method here, which is called main zinc. I'm gonna call this main zinc. And I'm just gonna call this. All right, so the, the main, um, the main uh, description or or characteristic about a single way framework is that it's a change on the syntax of how you write your promises and your asynchronous code, right? Um, basically, making it look like sequential code um, in 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 a normal JavaScript environment, right? So, basically, you label a function as a sync, and this function is labeled to return a promise and it's going to be managed as an async and it's going to be managed uh just just as a promise right we're going to see the difference right first of all the first thing you need to notice is that every every function that is going to re execute an uh an async code uh it has to be labeled as an async function right um here similarly you get the Promise from the request. Uh, so we're going to use the, the sync await framework now. Instead of doing the dot then, we could use the await uh, 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 keyword in order for this section automatically to resolve into uh, you know whatever response is going to be coming here. So we're going to change this because this is going to return instead of response. And the way that we're going to change that second request is just simply by doing this, right? So we get rid of all this. And this is gonna be the response. Couple of things to notice here, right? Uh, first of all, we have to make this function in sync. We have to set up the await for the promises to be resolved. So remember that we don't change. We didn't change anything here. This function are still re returning a promise, and that's we w that's why we can await them because the promises are the only thing that could be await, right? Um, the other thing here is that same thing. We that is the way that we change this. We we don't have to use callbacks, functions, or anything like this. Then uh, you know the syntax looks pretty different. It doesn't necessarily look better. Or this area is more optimal or faster. It just looks different, right? The other thing is that now that um, this is an async function, then this my code is complaining a little bit because I'm ignoring this this return promise because as I label the function as a sync, you know it just returned this. But just gonna test that just to see what's the result on this, right? So just just run the script, right? returns exactly the same as the previous script. It just looks different, right? So uh, main differences between, uh, you know, a sync await, and this, this may be really like a small block of text here. Differences. So many people call this just sync that sugaring, right? Just making it look a little bit better or how it's supposed to, right? The second difference will be how you manage error, right? Error man management. We didn't saw that here. Let's just do like a quick test for running this. So as this is now an awaitable, right? The way that that um, an await function returns an error is just by using the construct that already JavaScript has for managing errors, right? A try catch block. We could test this. Let's just go through error and let's put this error, right? And then we we could we put like a simulation here. 
Let's put it here. Whoops. You can do this, right? If we send this A as zero, let's try. Let's try this. Right? So we generated this. Uh, we generated an error. Oh, the, the throw was on the first. So let's do something instead of doing this. Let's get this back to one and this zero, right? So the error that I got there was because um, I didn't catch the error in this uh, request, right? Which would be the same if I didn't put this catch block or this if error here from here, right? So <clears throat> first of all. Oh, you know, syntax triggering, uh, you know, and error management, right? Uh, third, third, uh, one condition that once once you label a function as, as a sync, it will always <coughs> return a promise, even if your code is not sync, right? And last and final thing, that promise that all, all that we talk about, right? Um, it's a little bit different how you use it with a sync away, right? So if you wanted to do, let's say that I want to do two requests simultaneously to the same make request promise, right? Uh, let's say that this, let's forget about error management for just a second, just for simplifying this, right? So if I do this, right, there is no way that I could uh, execute the pull request at the same time with the await, right? Because the await will execute this synchronously, right? And will not move to the next sequence or to the next function call until this is completed, right? So the promise that all only works with promises, right? You have to have the promise objects to make this happen, right? So instead of going to the response, I'm gonna call this request one and this request two, and I'm just gonna remove the way, right? And this will become promises again, and I could resolve them here together at the same time. So I, I don't have to wait four seconds. I will just wait like roughly about two seconds, right? So the promise dot all is funny because the promise for the all returns the promise itself, right? And then I could handle, I could choose to handle it both ways, either with that in catch, or I could choose to handle it with the await. Right? If I choose to handle it with the await, I could catch the response one and response two, because it will return the same amount of promises uh, that I'm returning, right? And same thing, if any of those requests throws an error, I will have to put, the, uh, put here a try catch to catch them. Response one, right, and response two. Let's just set this as three, just to not to get the ugly error. And then both of these promises are gonna be solved exactly the same time, right? Uh, it's just gonna call one, jump to the other one, and both are gonna be trying to be resolved at the same time. Let's just do this. So instead of waiting for four seconds, so I'm just waiting for two, right? Of course, you can only do this if Request two doesn't depend on request one or the other way around, and that way you can, uh, you know, execute them both at the same time. This is a very good optimization, right? Just be aware that when you're, it is possible to resolve large lists to make, I don't know, if I want to get the details of a list of a hundred things that I have on my API, right? Just be aware that um, browsers resources and computer resources are limited, right? And at some point, you cannot do like that many requests at the same time. The system is just going to get slower, just just not going to get a response. Or even though the request server that you're, uh, you know, uh, doing petitions to, it can handle like more more than 10, 20, or 100 requests from the same client, right? It just start like trying error. That happens a lot when you're actually uh, working with real world. So I'm just going to create a repo here. 
for this, I'm going to push this to GitHub. I'm going to add the link of the repo on the video. I'm in, um, just going to blow that and, and you know, put the links there and also probably the presentation, right? So, guys, thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, make sure that if you like, like the video, hit the like button and subscribe for see more upcoming videos. Share the video with someone else and make sure to leave any comments if I make a mistake or if you guys want to see any other video uh, being posted on the channel. Thanks. Thanks for watching.